stunned weather experts yesterday. Atmospheric Compression Explanation Day. The event of 2016 is underway. It really is underway, and most people don't know what atmospheric compression is or what that has to deal with. Maybe they think it's a compression of the atmosphere or something else. It, well, it, you know, it's partly, partly that. But it's, going, it's, it's been responsible for a lot of things, and many people have been speculating and coming up with explanations as to why the weather is like it is and why these extreme events are happening. And there are many theories, but I can't say all the theories are wrong, but I can't say any one theory is right either. Right? Because at best, it is speculation. Even if you have all the facts, you don't have all the facts. So we're not going to get into why it's happening so much as what to expect and it will help you to interpret what you're feeling too so we're going to be talking about all sorts of well just get ready for it <laughs> because they're going off the they're going off the deep end and some of the weather phenomena is, is is increasing every year but the question is why what's that have to do with atmospheric compression and what can we expect like hail size changing well, let's start with the thermal sphere. Do you guys know what the thermal sphere is? Anybody familiar with that? The Earth is layered in segments as the atmosphere begins with the troposphere, which is very close to the Earth, right? The troposphere contains all the vapors of which we breathe, nitrogen, 78%, oxygen, 21%, okay? Then above, uh, above the troposphere, you have the separation layer, which is called a pause of the tropopause. So when you hear somebody say uh, tropopause or, or stratopause or mesopause, those are the layer, the boundaries between the atmospheres. The atmospheric layers begin with the troposphere, then it goes up to the stratosphere, then it goes up to the mesosphere, then it goes up to the ionosphere, then it goes up to the thermosphere, right? And then it goes up to the magnetosphere. And in between those, you have layers where each atmosphere is separated. Okay, everybody following me? Each atmosphere is separated. The atmospheric compression event is actually happening in the mesosphere up to the magnetosphere. Right? That's where it's happening. Heavier particles are coming into the mag... Now, it's a, it's a, it's the, the thermosphere and the magnetosphere, I need to explain this to you so that you can properly understand. In the thermosphere, right, it changes based upon solar activity. I'll give you an example. During solar maximum, the thermosphere heats up to about 12 or, or 2,011 degrees Fahrenheit. How many of you knew that? The thermosphere. One of the atmospheres outside of the Earth, it heats up to about 2,000 and 1,100 degrees. It's pretty hot, right? And it expands during solar maximum. How many of you knew that? It expands, which means it gets larger, more, it gets more spacious and everything. It expands. Now, during solar minimum, which is why they watch space weather so much, because you can't do anything about the sun if it decides to cut up. But you can monitor things here on Earth, and they know how it's going to impact the people. But during solar minimum, it contracts and cools. It cools off. Many of you probably didn't know that. But it gets very cool compared to, you know, what it is. During maximums, about 1,100 degrees Celsius. And then it cools from there, right? So it's very hot up there. But the reason why that heat does not burn up our craft, because the space shuttle is up there, 
right below the uh, magnetosphere. The space station is, is about um, 500 kilometers above the surface of the Earth in the thermal sphere at the base of the magnetosphere. And the reason why it does not burn up in the, in the thermal sphere is because molecules are spaced out a lot. So it's not a lot of matter, right, out there. It's matter out there, molecules and things. But molecules carry heat. They transfer heat. There's hardly anything up there to actually transfer the heat. Thus, it physically feels cool, but the temperature is still hot. I know it's very strange to understand, but bear with me. Now, as we're entering in, the Earth and the solar system are moving into new parts of the heavens, period. Because if you think about it, Earth, think of Earth like a ship, like a spaceship or something, all right? Or like a car. And this car is on a boat. The boat would be our solar system. This boat is traveling over the ocean, which would be space. And so as this boat moves, so does the car. So everything is moving into a different part of space itself. Well, it just so happens that the part we're moving into is a dense part, right? Now, what makes this difference different than the previous parts we've been into is that molecules were not so compacted. Thus, the Earth didn't burn up or anything. None of the planets really burnt down, right? But as matter is introduced, or we go into a dust cloud, those that dust is going to carry heat, heat from the sun. All right, everybody copying me. So, as molecules condense, heat is thus transferred from one molecule to another. Thus, you feel physical heat, okay? Physical heat, all right? Now, we're moving into a portion of space that's a whole lot more denser concerning molecules than what we've ever been in. And this is causing massive concerns. Massive concerns. The last time we moved, or, or it is believed that we moved into this part of the, this, uh, this part of space or different regions of space just like this, well, the last time an ice age happened. All right, this next one's a little creepy. I want to it's see little, what you guys think. Mm, okay? It is isn't. it isn't. I heard about she, this. She, <laughs> Brooke likes this idea, which tells you a lot about Brooke. Listen to this story. Okay, so if you forgot your ticket to a, a game, a soccer game in Argentina, okay. it's not a problem because you can use the microchip that's been embedded under your skin by the Crazy. team. An Argentinian yeah. soccer team planning experimentally to this point to offer supporters a chance to implant a microchip in their skin Let's them walk right through, like easy pass in your right. car. It's an easy pass. You just walk right into the stadium. But the easy pass is in your car, not in your wrist. That's see, but see, I'm not really thinking about it in terms of sports as much as I would love to put one in my kids. <laughs> just to know where I, they I are. Know, like I know it's creepy and really futuristic, mm -hmm. but I, my dog has one. Right. And she ran away and ended up like so we live downtown, and she ended up like in Harlem. Mm -hmm. And they somebody did deliver her to a, a facility, a, a place, and they scanned her, and then they found us. And I honestly am not completely against chipping my children. Have you, have you proposed this to the girls? I, I, I haven't. No, I thought I would do it in their now sleep. They, now they know. <laughs> I would, I would put it. Just, mom, uh, yeah, yeah. mom, what just was that? Oh, I don't know. Sleep. It's a mosquito. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's something about it. I don't know about the scanning and that the people are like, oh, it'll help you in the subway. You're going to be programming them to eat their vegetables with a button. It's going to happen, though. Yeah. We're scanning things with our eyes. Yeah. You know, that, uh, you know, when you, you, it's not just a thumbprint anymore. It's not just, so I wouldn't right. put it past it being done. I, c couldn't we just put it in our phone? Everyone's, everything's right. in the phone. It's exactly. like the phone. When you got on a plane now, you can just, right? you go yeah. like that. Because how do you find your children if they somehow get kidnapped? All right. Uh, so I'm really <laughs> going. I'm bringing it, this is going. Down. Bring it yeah. back to the black list. <laughs> back to the black list. So the official, by the way, for the soccer team says the chip does not have a tracking device. Oh, okay. okay. So they can't uh, follow you, they claim. And so it carries insane. only basic information about the fan. My thing then about this like is them, it's like not it. that hard to walk in now. They have scanners on your ticket and you go beep and Plus, you walk in. Except I like the tracking device. Just, I like a little working low jack on, a whole on my other babies. chip behind closed doors right. with a team of scientists. I want a baby so, low. Yeah. Baby low jack. That's what I want. That's 
that's because of a proposed law by Kuwait that would require people coming to visit to submit DNA tests so they can tag anyone who comes into the country. This database would be the first of its kind in the world, and if you don't take it as an invasion of privacy, the application is somewhat wonderful if you're an officer investigating. Terrible news if you're a producer of Law and Order. Not only do we have to deal with things coming past us, but where we are moving into means no alleviation from the elements. All right, so we're moving into a place that's very dense. And so the thermosphere, that temperature of 1100 degrees Celsius, which is uh, 2000 plus degrees Fahrenheit, people are going to begin to actually feel that who are up there. They're going to have to abandon the space station. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You hearing what I'm saying? As the thermosphere becomes more dense, it's going to physically heat up. There's no way they can stay in the space station at 2,000 degrees on the outside. Right now, the hottest heat that they feel, right, because it's so, it's so incredibly, it's just spacious up there, and it's not very dense. The density is not that much. They can stay up there, and it's, you know, it'll get about 200 degrees on one side, of which are protected, minus 275 on the other. But after the molecules begin, after we move into a place of space that's very dense, those particles are going to carry heat. So anything up there is going to burn. Right? Also, there's a weight factor. There's a weight factor. Now, with weight comes momentum, correct? With weight comes momentum. Momentum is the energy of something as it is moving. And then you get into forces and all that stuff. But with, I'm just telling you, with weight comes momentum. So that the thermosphere is going to become heavier and heavier. So what happens when the thermosphere becomes heavier? What happens? Yes, sunlight's too, Wendy. But they, you know, when this happens, when they think, because they'll heat up and begin to burn, and they'll be, they, some of them have nuclear reactors on board, and these reactors cannot sustain 2,000 degree temperatures. No cooling off, right? They go critical and poof. They, they blow up in the atmosphere. Now, I'm telling you this in a nice way, but it scares people to death who know about it, okay? So this is happening as we enter into a new part of space that we're not familiar with. It's becoming very dense, all right? Is everybody with me so far? Because I'm not just whistling Dixie. I'm not telling you something of a great theory. Oh, that's a great theory, very interesting. No, this is not interesting. This is something real, something that people are going to have to contend with, something that's not good at all. But something people need to know about. Now, don't don't listen to me in the perspective. Oh, I got to save my own life. Stop doing that. Just taking the information, understand what is, right, and go about your life knowing, knowing that somebody in the body of Christ told you this before it ever took place, and thus you have understanding. All right, that's what it's for, so that you don't look up and become fearful because you feel that nobody ever informed you of what's taking place. Because when things happen against what most people think, that's when fear settles in, right? If you pin your hopes and dreams to the outcome of biblical events as you have figured them out, or somebody else has figured them out, and it happens the opposite way, you're going to feel like, oh my Lord, I have no knowledge. I'm abandoned. I've been deceived. And you're going to have real fear. But if you're aware of things that will happen and things that could potentially happen but we're not talking about potentials here but if you're aware if you don't put limitations on god saying that he can fulfill his word how he wants to do it not how we have figured it out well then you'll be in a better place because you truly will believe yes god's in control of his own prophecy surely let every man be a liar let god's word be true how about that one because it is, they are his prophecies, not ours, right? If they were our prophecies, we would be in control of the events that were being prophesied. But we're not in control of the events. Thus, they're not ours. And God knows how he's going to fulfill them. And we may only guess and speculate and give a best guess. But it's important to know them that when they begin to happen, you'll have a biblical foundation and the Lord's Holy Spirit is going to remind you of his scriptures and you'll be able to put it in the context having no fear when it takes place, right? That's how that works. 
most people spend a lifetime trying to know beforehand and for what. They spend all their life trying to find out what will happen to them, the doom that's coming, and they don't belong to Christ. And so all they're doing is scaring themselves to death because whatever doom they see coming is going to take them, not the children of God. All right? Okay, so everybody understand that about the earth moving into a very dense part where molecules are present like a like dust that you can't see in the beginning dust is very small and it's able to transfer heat which means everything is going to begin to heat up the last time this caused an ice age which is what most of the scientists well the, the, most of the scientists on earth right now they know we're in a downswing about to go into an ice age they think right but it's not going to happen that way because we've already passed a certain mark according to time and so it's going to heat up tremendously heat up care for you everything will be affected and we're going to get to some of that but as a thermal sphere actually we feel a physical heat to the thermal sphere because molecules are, are, are being thrust into it. It's going to gather. It's going to become heavier. Then we have to deal with the weight. So now we have a 1,200 degree blanket surrounding the earth. The physical feeling of that is going to be about five to 600 degrees. And it will fluctuate based on density, based on movement in the thermosphere. Any movement in the thermosphere of those molecules, right, with a base temperature of 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit could actually jump to plasma, right? It'd be in the 5,000 degree range. Nothing will survive up there. Nothing. See, it's a fine line between heat and then a, a formation of matter, which is plasma. There, there's a fine line. And once something is so superheated, it becomes plasma, right? It takes on brand new properties. It doesn't just evaporate or go away. Plasma has properties and characteristics that will begin to take over or just just fry everything up there. Plasma also generates exotic particles all by itself, which will then begin to flood the lower atmospheres and change the color of our skies because we'll end up with a plasma sky. Okay? And that's what they also know that during this process, something else happened. During this process, where the thermal sphere increases in its weight, something happens to the magnetosphere. Portions of the magnetosphere will be gone, overwhelmed by forces that oppose it, which is electromagnetism, right? Electromagnetism can always overwhelm the magnetic forces of the Earth. More and more particles that go into the thermal sphere are going to be highly charged. It's going to be an electrical nightmare up there, right? Which then will result in electromagnetic fields again, which are around everything anyway, but they're in balance. Which means for a while, things are going to be out of balance. It'll overwhelm the magnetosphere. And they have also found out if you change anything in the mag, you, you see, it is thought that inside the Earth controls the magnetosphere, right? But they didn't really think of something. In electronics, a battery powers the circuit, correct? Uh, your battery powers your phone, right? But have you noticed that your phone gets hot when, when it's doing things? When you make a call and put your phone up to your ear, doesn't it get hot? Doesn't it? It gets hot, right? That's called feedback. Is what that is. You can think of that as feedback. That's actually the amperage, the rate of flow of the electrons going through the circuitry back into the battery. And so the battery heats up. So then I tell you this, what happens when the thermal sphere becomes highly charged and it begins to interact with the magnetosphere, right? What's going to happen is a feedback loop going back into the core of the earth. That energy that goes back into the core of the earth will increase the magnitude of whatever's going on inside the earth and then we got a real problem it's called volcanism because that that energy can't go anywhere so it's going to be released it's already overwhelmed the magnetic field lines right so the result is an increase in heat 
That increase in heat will continue to expand the core of the Earth of what's inside. So magma begins molten rock and metals start getting on the move. The ground heats up. You know what happens when the ground heats up? It's happened in various parts of the world over courses of time. Let me tell you what happens. You could go to, let's just use Nebraska as an example because it's one of the most protected places in the U.S. But let's just say you could go outside one morning in Nebraska and all the fields that you saw, they're dead over the course of one night fried from the root up see that heat will heat up the ground <clears throat> it will dry the soil and begin to heat the roots of any plant that's there and then guess what if it heats the ground the plants die from the bottom up so vegetation will die you will see that you will see vegetation on a massive scale die you'll see that so and that's going to be a product of part of the expansion of the interior of the earth. Okay, everybody with me so far? This is not doom and gloom. This is just what's, it's, it's taking place already. It's just going to be increased as the thermal sphere, as more matter is introduced into the thermal sphere. So then the heat and the feedback loop is going to cause all sorts of different changes that we've already read about in the Bible. The funny thing is this, this information was never intended to match to anything in prophecy, right? Because the information was gathered based upon simulations. The simulation doesn't know about prophecy. It doesn't. And then wouldn't you know it? And when I say simulation, we're not talking about theoretical things that are happening, right? We're talking about something that's taking place already. In Revelations, verse... Chapter 8, verse 6 and 7. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. Oh boy. And they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees was burnt up. And all the green grass was burnt up. Why? Can you imagine? There was hail and fire mingled with blood that was coming down upon the earth. And then a third part of the trees on the earth were burnt up, and all the green grass was also burnt up. And it's just starting. It's just starting. The first trumpet, hail, fire and blood, ice and fire rained from the sky, burning up a third of all the earth's trees and all the grass. This is a ecological disaster without parallel to this point in the history of mankind. Its results are incalculable. To make matters even worse, John the Divine also has that blood arrives with the hail and fire as the prophet Joel had predicted. When in Joel it says, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and the fire and pillars of smoke, in Joel chapter 2 verse 30, and this is only the first trumpet, and we must understand, there is seven trumpets. This is not going to be a very pretty thing. With more, a, a greater introduction of particles in the thermosphere, it will certainly be enhanced. And it just so happens these things match biblical prophecy, but they stand alone. That's the thing, is that this is not, uh, this is not being skeptical. Uh, it shouldn't be fear mongering. You know what fear mongering is? Let me tell you what fear mongering is. Fear mongering concerning the word of God doesn't exist. 
Fear-mongering, when it's received as fear-mongering concerning the word of God, is when a person is in is disobedient and in rebellion, and they want to do something in the world, and they find out that the world may not be there so they can fulfill their dreams in the world. So if your dreams are in the world, you're scared to death that something's going to happen to the world because you have nothing else left. But to a Christian, if something happens to the world, you say, well, yeah, that's what our Father told us in the prophecies. So it's not to you, it's not fear-mongering. You're like, oh, we're going home. To them it is fear-mongering, right? You get close to death, and you'll say, well, if I die, I go to be with the Father. If they get close to death, they say, oh, no, I'm scared to die because I'll have nothing in death. You see, that's why. Sarah has a question, Michael, then why are these folks going to go into deep underground bases if the ground is heating up? They Well, listen, I, a long time ago, Sarah, I said, I was trying to tell people in COT and some other people, I said, you don't build an underground base unless you know what you're building it for. Okay? Have you, they, they use, do you know what titanium is used for? Does anybody know? And some of the other crystal metals. You need to know about the metals. Do you not know that they have, listen, they have, a, they have lead beads. All right? And that Russia actually designed this. They have, they have, now listen to me close. This is real. This is not false. This is not theory. This is not some wild story. This is true. They have metals that they have developed in part with the space station. Listen to me close. It's a formation of land, but you can't make it on Earth because of the forces on Earth. You have to go up into the thermal sphere to make it. The lead beads, the nuclei of the material in the lead beads change places all the time. Also, the lead itself right can fall into another piece of lead, a lead bead you can have two lead beads and one piece of lead can absorb the other right because all it is is a transformation of matter you can also take that lead bead and transform it into another state and it winks out of one spot and goes right into another now this is not these are lead beads this is a way that is very expensive the way they develop them so they're doing weird stuff like this on the space station there are also metals that can rearrange themselves and go through other material. They have metals that can do that. And so what I'm telling you is this, is that these, these metals and everything else are being developed for use on Earth. You cannot create them. You cannot create the, the blueprint, so to speak, on Earth. You have to do it by the space station. Because having, having metals in cool temperatures of minus 240 plus turn something into a superconductor and they're working with superconductors to bring them back to earth and to put them underground you have to have pressure for these things to actually work thus making the, the walls and everything else very strong so it takes pressure to maintain these metals all right pressure pressure is like the it, that's the environment they're used to Okay, and uh, so that's what they're doing. So when they build these underground bases, when they initially did it, that was just the shell. All the while, they've been working under there, placing the protective walls in there so that it can withstand lava and molten rock. It absolutely can. They have a lot of nitrogen down there, right? Which will take lava and freeze a barrier around it so it doesn't matter how much lava and molten rock or anything else hits it. With recycled nitrogen, they can perpetuate the uh, solidifying a rock wall. It'll be hot on one side, cooler on the other, which is why they invested $2.2 trillion in insulation materials. How many of you knew that? Maybe that's where part of our budget went. But $2.2 trillion went into insulation materials. Now, if you can do it in space, it also works with lava, just so you know, okay? So, yes, they're going to protect themselves, and the Bible says they will. So those bases are fortified, and they, they are, you know, it's just a shame that mankind can develop these things, right? And they won't use them for the good of the people. But they use them for war and to protect themselves. That, that's the unfortunate part. But don't worry. Our Lord is coming back and we will rule and reign with Christ. And all that stuff is going away permanently. It will never come back again. So I'm thankful for that. But it's a shame to know of things. And unfortunately, they use it for war and to save themselves. 
that's what the the mindset of humanity is all messed up and that's why the true body of christ is so small because you can't be a hateful person in the true body of christ that's not going to work out too well right and now that we have these elections happening there's going to be a true separation between those who abide in love and those who don't and that's really how you're going to know who is who those who do not abide in love and stay within love right they eventually become what they are but anybody who loves the lord understands that god is love and thus they abide in love they always give the truth it's not love is not being a pacifist but it's to keep god with you so that if someone is in sin you're not going to pat them on the back and tell them it's going to be okay you're going to give answer by the holy spirit and say you better uh, you might want to change that because you're burning slowly you'll be the one with the holy spirit that goes out there and says listen the lord said that if you continue to do this you're going to reap the benefits of his plagues and it's funny because the two witnesses will go out there and issue forth plagues so will you because the holy spirit is going to remind you of the very plagues you're going to be partakers of if they don't get out of babylon and the plagues are going to come to babylon babylon being the whole world anybody who's outside who does not abide in christ is babylon just so you know there's no great ground you can't decide which one you're going to be in so everybody following me on the thermal sphere right how that we're going to have dense materials coming in all right it's going to become dense as it becomes dense it's going to heat up and then there's going to be a physical effect to the 1200 degree temperatures or, or the uh, 2000 degree fahrenheit temperatures 1100 degrees celsius that's already there it's going to have a physical effect so it's going to begin to destroy things in space and and this is already known about right already known about but as this happens the thermal sphere is going to increase in weight and elect electromagnetic energies which will begin to overwhelm the magnetosphere it's going to cause a feedback loop going into the core of the earth heating up the ground as it heats up the ground I mean, you, the earth is going to be heated from the ground outward. And you see, when they record it through, through ice layers, they recorded that during these ice ages, underneath that ice was incredibly warm. Incredibly warm. How, it, it's funny, we have an ice age, everything is covered with ice. Well, how did humanity survive? How did they survive? They went underground, but how, what did they eat? because there was vegetation under the ground because it became like the tropics underneath the ice that's why but the cold came so quick right the forces you're dealing with are so immense that that cold atmosphere that cold weather came so quick that animals were eating off trees and they were frozen in that condition they found a bee the remnants of a bee that was feeding from a plant frozen in that condition the bee couldn't run or do it was an instant freeze instant freeze right i mean instant freeze and they're counting on this coming back the ice age again and according to their calculations their calculations they have estimated the gaps in between these ice ages and they have found out that it takes no more than 20 years right to be on the downswing going back into an ice age again but the problem with that is this this time we're dealing with a celestial event involved with the changing of the thermal sphere that um, happened in the time of Egypt because they have the particles in the ground they know the true story of Egypt they know their chariots underneath the ground buried under listen under hundreds of feet of sand and dirt are chariots Pharaoh's stuff down there right they already know this they dug it up they just didn't show you you can cry about that later don't don't be worried about what they don't show you just believe the word of god because what's in there is true it is true they know the ark of the covenant is not here on earth they have people on a ghost hunt the ark of the covenant is also called the ark of his testimony according to revelation the ark of his testimony is in the heavens not on earth why would god leave that powerful thing here on earth he didn't he didn't so they often find the shell of things but the core element of what they're looking for is not there right anyway anyway <clears throat> so they are building or have built they've already established underground communities you just don't know how deep they can go right in fact you don't know the depth of the earth and it's so funny 
they fool you in a big way because they misrepresent the figures right unless you're a pilot you scarcely know about the lower uh, uh, altitudes which are adjusted right through uh, uh, certain pressures of metals they feel differently and so you have an hg reading and so much and you have to set your 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 your, your uh, barometrics in the avionics of an aircraft things of that nature and when you go up in altitude you get the proper altitude but those are calibrated and adjusted according to a base calibration which means that altitude can be anything right <clears throat> it can be anything it goes like this most people use computer time right so if somebody decided to take three hours away from the day, they adjust a master computer, your device is automatically updated, you would know the difference, right? And so they moved everything. Everything has been moved from, guess what, analog to digital, right? Compasses don't work very well these days, have you noticed? Soon enough, they'll be jammed and overwhelmed with some magnetic things, to magnetic things they'll be overwhelmed with and so you're going to be stuck with digital everything operates from gps your telephone does too everything operates by gps and not analog signals everything is triangulated and pinpointed so they've got communication under control through gps systems they have the internet control through gps systems so if somebody pulls a plug on the gps systems even the redundant systems won't work thus your phone won't know how to connect to what tower because its location will be unknown, right? So what I'm telling you is this. Every device has to have a location in order to operate and function. Even some of the older computers that were made, if you have a computer made after 2000, it too has to have an identification of work. And now everything does, and so they force these new operating systems upon everybody. They did that so that nobody can actually see continental drift because they have to continue to support this lie of evolution and if you ever saw continental drift or the size if you traveled from one side of the earth or one side of a continent to the other you would look on a map and say these sizes don't match that's what you'd say so then you would think well this is kind of deceiving right that's what you say this is kind of deceiving and they do this because they've created a paradigm in your eyeballs, in your mind, that you'll never suspect what's actually happening. And believe me, every little thing they hide is important to them, that you believe what they present to you, right? So you actually do believe what you're being, what's presented to you, right? And some people go so far as they say, well, the people believe that their vote counts. Well, they do. They believe that their vote counts until they begin to look into it and they say wait a minute because nobody's gonna you're not gonna get the whole world together without the officials and talk to each other and say who did you vote for you're not gonna do that so once you submit your vote you don't know who voted for what correct care for you says my god i mean to throw the subject off but is hollow earth theory true hollow earth theory is a theory right i mean can i share with you guys something about the crust of the earth if you look up in the sky as far as you can see you can't see the space station, right? Right? You can't see it. So let's say from the ground up to the space station is a small layer of the inside of the Earth. So the ratios you imagine are not correct. In other words, we could have tons of stuff in the first layer of Earth, but there are billions of layers below that, right? So the ratios of how they present Earth are wrong. You could have a you could have caverns in that first layer, right? That are twenty five thousand feet high. That means you can't see the top of it. They could have massive cities in there. They could have massive anything. In there. there are oceans within the crusts of the earth that are not connected to our oceans. How many of you knew that? There are oceans inside the earth inside the earth much but I mean, there, there, there's oceans in there there are cavernous places inside the earth but that's nowhere near the core of the earth right that's just in the layers of the crust of the earth but through ratios they begin to misrepresent things and so you look you think that the crust of the earth in comparison with a, um, a 
If you compared how high jets fly to the surface of the earth, you would probably pick up a basketball and hold your hand, you know, six inches out from the basketball and say, that's the cap of the atmosphere. Well, that's a lie. Because if you stuck your finger flat on the basketball, then your fingernail, right? If you stuck it flat, your hand like your palm in a basketball, then your fingernail represents 25,000 feet. All right? Your fingernail represents 25,000 feet. So that means your fingernail compared your, the, the, the height of your finger from the base where your fingerprints are to the fingernail represent 25,000 feet when you're touching a basketball. Look how huge the comparison is. Now, you could have many finger layers in there. 25,000 foot layers inside the earth could go a long way. So they just lie. You know, the representation is wrong. It really is. And that's even in the Bible that those who know these things will never tell them to you. They will never be revealed to you. They won't be revealed because they will end up, the world always ends up making their own prophecies that they make correct themselves. And that's why we trust them so much. People say they hate the government, but that's not the truth. They're just complaining because they still rely upon them. Because if trouble comes, people will say, well, where's the government? When Katrina came, all those people who hated the government, when Katrina came, they said, well, where are they? They wanted them. They can complain all day, but they were looking for them. When something happens in the USA, all these people who don't like the government, they're going to be looking for the government to have a solution. That's what I'm saying. This world is, is full of hypocrisy. It really is. It's full of hypocrisy. And, and what that's doing is it's, it's going to cause a lot of fear in folks. Because now, even if you knew the truth yourself, how can you convey the truth when you're flying in the face of hundreds of years of scientific discovery, they call it? You would be ridiculed. Nobody would listen to you or anything else. Because you're flying in the face of what's already established. Right? Nobody's going to hear what you're saying. You're flying in the face of something already established. And so they would look at you as someone strange. So I say this, that, and this is why I deal with the topics of which we're going to have to deal with, like weather phenomena, like atmospheric compression, like the heating of the thermosphere, like plasma in the magnetosphere and thermosphere in time when the sky changes colors, right? Like the heating of the earth from the ground up vegetation dying from the heat which is going to cause the unexplainable drought things of that nature all right things of that nature right and and also the composition of the atmosphere is going to change so it's going to be very difficult to breathe along coastlines right you you actually most people think that they live by oxygen alone that well that's not the truth how many of you know that the air you breathe the, it, what you survive from is 98% nitrogen and only 21% oxygen. How many people know that? Do you guys know that? That you require, listen, the air you breathe is, is I'm sorry, 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. Are you aware of this? Most people are not aware of this divers are because they don't want to get the bends and they know that you have to go through decompression and things of that nature because of the nitrogen it can begin to bubble up in your blood and that's very painful uh, but 78 uh, percent of what you're breathing in is nitrogen only 21 percent is oxygen only 21 percent right but what's happening is the composition right below the tropopause which is the layer between the stratosphere Right? And the troposphere, which we breathe, the air we breathe, is changing. It's, it's altering. It's changing. As these particles get introduced into the thermal sphere, these heavier particles will make their way down to the stratosphere, then to the troposphere, which is going to change the composition of the air that we breathe. So breathing will become a little difficult in time. It will. It's going to become difficult. And if you never took a warning before, right? And this is why every <clears throat> everybody that I know, honestly, who smokes, I ask them, hey, you, you got you to gotta back off the smoking because it's going to be very difficult to breathe, right? And smoke is just not going to help you. It's going to be very difficult to breathe. 
And when you when you smoke, you know, you build up tar in your lungs, and and that's even that make, this is going to make it worse. It's going to be quite apparent how difficult. Have, have you guys? Has anybody ever had pneumonia? Has anybody ever ever had pneumonia? Well, if you had pneumonia, you know how it is. You know how hard it is to breathe, right? So when these heavier gases begin to introduce themselves into the to the uh, uh, troposphere, and this is what he said: In that day, every city will burn, saith Yahweh. People are going to find themselves. You know, especially on the coastlines, because there are certain elements when they when they hover over water, hot water, by the way, the water is going to heat up too. When they hover over that hot water, they're going to thrust them back up. It's like taking a shower. It's how it's going to be on the coast, like steam coming up from the water, right? Because of the dramatic changes in temperatures and things of that nature, steam will. So it's going to be very difficult to breathe. And when you know it in the Bible, you know in the Bible when it says, men's hearts failing them for fear for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. And then it goes into the seas and the waves roaring. And, and don't you wonder why in the world it would talk about the seas and the waves roaring? Why would it say that? It's, it's almost like a hint, right? It's almost like a hint that you're going to have ocean problems. Ocean, is that Luke 21, 25? There shall be signs in the sun, moon, and stars upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. And then when you backtrack Luke 21, 25 and look at this, you see something you may not have seen before. It says, and upon the earth, distress of nations, comma, with perplexity, semicolon, the sea and the waves roaring. It's almost like the perplexity of the nations is coming from the oceans, from the dramatic weather that's going to be upon the oceans, which lets me know that water is going to be damaging. The wind is going to be damaging. And when you know what the simulations, I'm telling you, they put the wind speeds up to 150 mile an hour straight line winds. And it, that's what it's building up to. And I tried to set the warning out there a long time ago. So these higher and higher winds wouldn't scare people to death. Like that's the end of the world. That's not going to be the end of the world. But the people are in tune with the changes in earth. How many of you believe in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? And how many of you believe in his word? How many of you do that? Now this is where, this is where scientists part from the word of God. I'm going to make a statement to you. Right? This is where scientists part with the word of God. You ready for this? It's because of this. The earth responds to the condition of men. If men are wicked, the earth is also wicked. That's where scientists, and, and, and it, that's where they just part. And they all, they're familiar with the scriptures. How many of you know that scientists are actually familiar with the scriptures? But they can't because they operate off from empirical data. Right? They operate from data points. They cannot accept the spiritual things of the Bible. And the earth responds to the conditions of men. Always. So if the condition of men is terrible, so the conditions of the earth will also be terrible. And wouldn't you know it, as these increased weather phenomena increase in volcanic activity, strange happenings in the heavens, are happening men have lost all their moral footing they really have you know it's gotten to the point where all you can do to some folks is suggest to them do not look at anything political because all you're going to do is become violent like they are you know there's also a scripture where the lord says um, he, he was talking about mankind's iniquity or the, his, the iniquity of his people and the wickedness and the hatred that they conveyed. And he said, my people love to have it so. That's very disturbing. It's very disturbing. Anyway, back to the atmospheric compression. So you guys see the beginnings. This is only the beginnings of compression. By the way, this process began five years ago. It's been happening, just so you know. It's not an overnight happening. It's building up. We're almost to the ignition point. The ignition point is when the, there's an equilibrium. 
right? In every layer of the atmosphere, there's, a, there's an equilibrium of particles, right? It's, equilibrium is like this. You guys ready for this equilibrium? Here it is. When you take water and it's at room temperature, it's not boiling point, it's not the freezing point, it's, in a, it's, it's water and it's a common state of matter. If you boil that water but keep the steam inside and you boil it and turn the oven off, it will eventually condense back down into its stable point, right? If you freeze that same uh, pot of water, it's going to condense and the water level looks like it's going to go low, but it condenses into ice. But if you put it back in room temperature, it turns back into water again and you lose no elements. That's called equilibrium. So it takes an external force to get things out of balance. The heat on your stove, right, takes it out of an of a, 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 an equals or balanced state. There's no more equilibrium. The water turns to steam. If you freeze it, you take it out of a balanced state, right? Now, there are volatile chemicals this way because the atmosphere can actually blow up. Oxygen is flammable. Nitrogen is flammable. But it's in equilibrium. So what happens when something external comes into play? It's going to knock off the balance. Heat is a driver, right? That can cause matter to become unstable. Heat is a driver, which means flash burns can happen. Flash burns, right? What will the second wave do to the atmosphere? We're, we're, we're going to talk about that this coming Wednesday, Wendy Lee. But in order to understand the truth about the second wave, you need to understand about this atmospheric compression. Particles in the thermosphere are everything. Oh, and by the way, as the thermosphere becomes heavier and heavier, do you know what happens to the surface of the Earth? the weight of the earth will begin to change. And because balance is important, equilibrium is important, if the crust of the earth gets heavier, then the core of the earth will begin to release, right? Not that it's pressing down on so much, but that the, the weight of the matter, its density will begin to grow right which also indicates there's a pressure change and so that pressure change equates to pain right it equates to pain now we're dealing with a pressure change that you guys are already feeling because it's happening but you're also going to deal with a change in gases change in gases you know what a change in gases just one percent would do it would take every step that you took, would be so hard, it would look like your legs weigh 10,000 pounds a piece. That's what it'd feel like because you can't breathe right. So you would have a heavy walk. You would walk like it is, you're just dying with every step. That's what happens when the material changes in the atmosphere. And it's going to change. Because in the earth, are some nasty chemicals, right? And right now they're bound to the core of the earth. So through this compression event and through a change in the magnetosphere, the feedback begins. Inside the earth heats up, gases are released. Like this carbon monoxide, you're gonna find that all over the place. Forget about tracking it just on the west coast. If, you, if you're tracking, and they will, they're going to just do away with those optics. That, the optics that I think you guys are seeing, I'm not sure. But I believe it's an algorithm that allows you to see chemicals in the, in the uh, uh, atmosphere, correct? But they're going to wipe that from that system, I'm telling you now. Because that carbon monoxide release is going to become so incredibly apparent that people are going to panic. It's okay if it's just in one spot, but it's going to be going all over the place. And you know what that means when it's released? It's, it's, it's going to be an ongoing problem. Carbon monoxide kills people in their sleep. There have been people in valleys near volcanoes and things of that nature 
And guess what has happened when they went to sleep? The carbon monoxide came up to about six and a half feet off the ground. And everybody who was underneath that six and a half feet, they died. They didn't even know they were dying. They woke up and they found entire villagers dead. It's called a silent killer. Silent killer. And so the, these are happenings that, that, you know, they're not jokes. They're not jokes. It, it's going to take place. Well, Mayor, that's what New York is worried about right now. Do you guys know that they have pumped a lot of money in New York to attempt to repair the gas lines? In fact, everybody's repairing. Uh, in 2011, 2011, they got together and they decided that the first part of the infrastructure that needed immediate attention were the gas lines because they know the earth is going to begin to heat. And so if you took notice... You probably saw people who work with gas companies, or if you work for one yourself, there were mandates on you to dig up certain pipes and to repel, repair them and put the new check valves in and everything else, right? And they went from steel to another composite material. They were getting rid of the steel, the, the, that antiquated steel. Well, in New York City, if you saw the schematic sphere, right? And then it goes up to the magnetosphere. And in between those, you have layers where each atmosphere is separated. Okay, everybody following me? Each atmosphere is separated. The atmospheric compression event is actually happening in the mesosphere up to the magnetosphere. Right? That's where it's happening. Heavier particles are coming into the mag... Now, it's, a, it's, a, it's the, the thermosphere and the magnetosphere. I need to explain this to you so that you can properly understand. In the thermosphere, right... It changes based upon solar activity. I'll give you an example. During solar maximum, the thermosphere heats up to about 12 or, or 2,011 degrees Fahrenheit. How many of you knew that? The thermosphere, one of the atmospheres outside the Earth, it heats up to about 2,011 hundred degrees. It's pretty hot, right? And it expands during solar maximum. How many of you knew that? It expands, which means it gets larger, more, it gets more spacious and everything. It expands. Now, during solar minimum, which is why they watch space weather so much, because you can't do anything about the sun if it decides to cut up. But you can monitor things here on Earth, and they know how it's going to impact the people. But during solar minimum, it contracts and cools. It cools off. Many of you probably didn't know that. But it gets very cool compared to, you know, what it is. During maximums, about 1,100 degrees Celsius. And then it cools from there, right? So it's very hot up there. But the reason why that heat does not burn up our craft, because the space shuttle is up there, right below the uh, magnetosphere. The space station is, is about um, 500 kilometers above the surface of the Earth in the thermosphere at the base of the magnetosphere. And the reason why it does not burn up in the, in the thermosphere is because molecules are spaced out a lot. So it's not a lot of matter, right, out there. It's matter out there, molecules and things. But molecules carry heat. They transfer heat. There, there's hardly anything up there. Well, just get ready for it. Because they're going off the they're going off the deep end, and some of the weather phenomena is, is is increasing every year. But the question is why? What's that have to do with atmospheric compression? And what can we expect? Like hail size changing? Well, let's start with the thermosphere. Do you guys know what the thermosphere is? Anybody familiar with that? The Earth is layered in segments. It's the atmosphere. It begins with the troposphere, which is very close to the Earth, right? The troposphere contains all the vapors of which we breathe. Nitrogen, 78%. Oxygen, 21%. Okay? Then above, uh, above the troposphere, you have the separation layer, which is called a pause of the tropopause. So when you hear somebody say uh, tropopause or, or stratopause or mesopause, those are the layer, the boundaries between the atmospheres. The atmospheric layers begin with the troposphere, then it goes up to the stratosphere, then it goes up to the mesosphere, then it goes up to the ionosphere, then it goes up to the therm... Atmospheric Compression Explanation Day. The event of 2016 is underway.
it really is underway, and most people don't know what atmospheric compression is or what that has to deal with. Maybe they think it's a compression of the atmosphere or something else. It, well, it, you know, it's partly, partly that. But it's, going, it's, it's been responsible for a lot of things, and many people have been speculating and coming up with explanations as to why the weather is like it is and why these extreme events are happening. And there are many theories, but I can't say all the theories are wrong, but I can't say any one theory is right either. Right? Because at best, it is speculation. Even if you have all the facts, you don't have all the facts. So we're not going to get into why it's happening so much as what to expect and it will help you to interpret what you're feeling, too. So we're going to be talking about all sorts of... Thank you. 